Our guest today is Raj Gupta, the former CEO of Roman Haas, and we're going to talk with him today about his book, uh, Eight Dollars and a Dream, My American Journey, uh, which he wrote with Sid Havely. And joining me in this conversation is my friend and colleague, Mike Yusim, who oversees the Wharton Center for Leadership and Change Management. Uh, uh, Raj, Mike, thank you so much for joining us today on Knowledge at Wharton. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Raj, perhaps to just start out uh, uh, with a very brief question, what inspired you to write this book? Well, you know, I have two daughters who married late, and then we had three grandsons born over a period of two years, three years. And both my daughters one day out of the blue came to me and said, Dad, uh, you, we have lived an interesting life all around the world, and these kids are so young, I don't know what stage you will be in by the time they are teenagers. So would you mind documenting family history? So that's how the project started, as a, writing the family history. Then, you know, by the time I got to the age of 22 and came to the United States, it became difficult to separate growing up in the U.S., raising a family, mm -hmm. finding my bearings at work, so and then it grew into something about living in England, living in France, living in Asia, and raising these two daughters, uh, living in different cultures, de dealing with different people. So it became an amal amalgam of the professional experience, the personal journey, and the family life. And as I got into it, you know, it became apparent that just my telling the story is not sufficient, and that's where we added this another dimension to this, is to have people who have spoken or have dealt with me at different times in my life. My mentors, uh, lead director, Sandy Moose, my predecessors, uh, my board colleague in Jack Kroll, and above all, was really having my two daughters and my wife speak on their own behalf. And that was totally unadulterated. <laughs> And in fact, it was a great insight for me uh, hearing from them as well. So it started off as a family history and it developed into something that uh, you now you see as a book. And we thought about, you know, who will be the audience for this book? And in fact, it wasn't clear whether it was like a personal life story, was it a business book, or was it something else? So it is pretty much story as it was lived, from my childhood growing up in India to my adult life and, of course, life post-retirement. So, Raj, in the book, you make a very compelling case for the life course that you've been on, the, the personal, as you've just described it, as the result of many people that you came to know, many people that influenced who you are, beginning with, of course, with your parents. And thinking about then the professional side of the book, you became chief executive of Roman Haas, a very large specialty, specialty chemical company acquired by Dow Chemical later on. And as you embarked on a career in business and management and ultimately leadership, if you could describe a couple of people that have been especially influential, maybe personal, maybe professional, in shaping the person that you are and then had to be as you ran Rome and Haas? So let me actually start with my parents, you know, because to me, both my mother and father, in their unique way, had tremendous influence, and six of us born over seven mm -hmm. years between 1944 and 1951. And the two things uh, I take away from growing up in that family, which was actually counterculture in India, one was living an honest life. And my father was a civil engineer building dams, bridges, and canals, and you know, graft was pervasive. But my father never accepted one rupee of bribe in his life. And the second thing was counterculture to me was respecting everyone, irrespective of what position they mm -hmm. occupied in the society, whether they were higher ups or the servers or the cleaners the driver, they treated everybody with respect. And those two things have stuck with me all my life. And the third thing I would say I carry away from my mother in particular was the notion that you work hard 
and you work honestly, consequences are beyond your control, except what comes as a result. Mm -hmm. you know? so, so I think those are the things that go back to my family and my parents. As an adult, I would say, you know, I, I was very fortunate to work in an organization, a Roman house, nearly 40 years, and it was a true meritocracy. You know, irrespective of where you came from, what your background was, and how you spoke your English, you felt like you were part of a family mm. and treated as equal, and you had an equal opportunity to contribute. So the fact I was given an opportunity to go work in England, which in fact in itself was a unique experience in the late 70s and early 80s. Then moving on to France and then coming back to England and then go, living in Asia for five years. Mm -hmm. The opportunity that company provided me were absolutely unbelievable. And I would say, you know, during that career, there were three or four people at Roman Haas who were instrumental in shaping me and believing in me more than I believed in myself. One was the CFO who recruited me, Fred Schaefer. The second one were my two predecessors, Larry Wilson, who was CEO before me for 10 years, and before him, Vince Gregory, who was the first non-family CEO for 20 years. Those four individuals uh, really had an incredible impact on me. And the one last one was Dr. Basil Vassilio, who was a Greek who was headed up Europe for Roman Haas, a unique mm -hmm. individual. But those four had an enormous impact on me uh, in shaping my What would beliefs. you single out from one of them that has been a kind of a lasting influence on who you are and what your style has been? So, you know, I learned mm -hmm. things that I wanted to practice, and I also learned things which I didn't particularly care to follow. So you learned both the good and the bad. Mm -hmm. and, so I, you know, from Larry Wilson, I learned something, which was maintaining your composure and calm demeanor under stress, and be a good listener rather than always presenting yourself as the person in charge. And I think to me that was a served, served me very well uh, during my career. With Dr. Vasily, who was a kind of fighter street fighter, <laughs> a very smart man, uh, but always controversial. Uh, I think, you know, I certainly learned uh, that you can have brilliant ideas, uh, but you also need to figure out how to best present them and get consensus around them. So Raj, just to then take that forward in time, we're all the product of our parents, our friends, uh, maybe a college or a high school teacher along the way, but as you became chief executive in 1999 of Roman Haas, that was a job you hadn't done before. You had not been a chief executive before. So while you brought many qualities, such as staying cool under fire from some of the mentoring you had, you also had to master a very challenging job. So just thinking about the first, maybe the first 12 months, what did you have to learn that you didn't already have in your rep your skill your skill repertoire set on becoming chief executive officer? Well, I can think of a number of things. First of all, you know, we transformed the company from a mid-sized specialty chemical company, largely organically grown, to investing six billion dollars of cash to buy three companies in rapid succession. Morton International, Rodell, and Leah Ronell. We went from 10,000 employees to 23,000 employees mm -hmm. over a period of one quarter. We went from zero debt to over four and a half billion dollars in debt. And we had completely new leadership team at the top. And so, so I think it was a task bigger than I thought, for sure. Uh, and, and you know, I think the way I approached this was Number one, to make sure that I got to hear from the board, each of the board members, and met with them individually to understand what they liked about the way we worked and what we could improve on, to make sure they knew me and they felt I had access to them and they had access to me. So, Raj, you actually went to meet with each of them individually? Yes, I did. I went out to where they were located and went out and spent a couple of hours with each one of them. Hmm. They, of course, knew me, I knew them, but it was always sitting in the boardroom and occasional dinner as a group. 
So this to me was extremely helpful and served me well as we managed our way through the challenging times for the first couple of years. The second thing was right after we made these acquisitions, everything that could go wrong did go wrong. <laughs> we had 64 ERP systems. Information was late in coming. Business was declining. Currencies were going the wrong way. And we had a new management team in place. So very quickly, you know, we said, you know, rather than trying to do everything, what are the two or three most critical things that we need to focus on? And that was to get right people and right jobs. Number two was to manage for cash. And number three, that we are not just in business for another six months or a year. We need to invest in our future, and that was globalization in Asia and investing in technology and innovation. And those were the four pillars that we really focused on for first two or three years after I became CEO to get the company through the crisis in a shape that it became you know, very successful after that. Yeah, that's great. Well, I was very really struck by what you said about you know, hitting a crisis uh, uh, as a result of these acquisitions because some of the research that I have seen shows how easy it is to destroy value after acquisitions and a lot of mergers don't work out for that reason. Uh, how, how did you gather your team around a strategy that would ensure that the mergers that you had entered into would build value rather than destroy value? Well, I wish I could say they were all successful. <laughs> You know, and, and I do agree that uh, more and more data shows that large, complex mergers destroy value rather than create value. Having said it, separating companies into spin codes which are more focused and divestitures of underperforming businesses always add value. So acquisition is a tricky game. And most of them really fail, in my view, because of people issues, less to do with the business logic or strategy because, you know, smart people make decisions about which businesses fit, what is the fair value, and you do a lot of homework on that before you do the acquisition. And once you do that, in my view, that's when the hard work begins. And it is the people side of the equation, if it's not handled right, is when things really fall off the cliff. And the second thing I would say is timely information. Mm -hmm. If you don't have information to manage a complex new company, you really are fighting a rear guard battle. I mean, those are the two things I would say, strategic logic, culture, all of that you can define up front. But uh, getting these two pieces right in terms of how would you manage, uh, who are the right people, and you have the information that really show that you're tracking the vision or the strategy, reason for which you made those acquisitions. And what kind of people issues did you face and how did you <clears throat> deal with them? So, you know, there are two or three different parts to this. One is, you know, you always find individuals who are very successful in building and growing. Mm -hmm. When they're faced with a tough challenge of a shrinking market, shrinking margins, a turnaround situation, that's a different skill. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people, you know, when you have a lot of tailwind behind you and things are going well and their growth-oriented mindset, and all of a sudden they're faced with this, it's hard for them to kind of recognize at first because they think they can get past that. And then most important, how, how to navigate your way to cut the cost, manage for cash, and really much more operational focus. So that's, that's one thing. The second thing I would say is just the demeanor of the people. And that goes back to staying calm under stress. Mm -hmm. You know, when you are under uh, extreme change situations where rapid action is required, you see two kinds of individuals generally. Ones who kind of just panic and they're trying to push buttons in many different fronts, and the other who kind of stay calm, figure out what the right priorities are, and just focus themselves and the whole organization on making sure that key things happen and not get troubled by or disturbed by the noise around them. Raj, just to turn to a career phase that followed your service at Roman Haas. In 09, you helped engineer a sale of the company to Dow Chemical. 
And in the years since then, you've served on a number of very prominent boards of directors, including Vanguard Group, the manager uh, of a, almost $5 trillion in assets these days, Tyco International that had gone through a wrenching restructuring, Arconic, a spinoff from Alcoa, uh, Hewlett Packard that, uh, when you were there, went through a, a breakup into its now two separate parts. And thinking about your role on these several different boards, uh, maybe the question comes down to this. What makes for a really good, independent, non-executive member of a board of directors? Great question, Mike. You know, I, uh, first of all, I've been very fortunate uh, that post Roman Haas, uh, I've had the opportunity to serve on boards of uh, leading companies uh, in different industries. Uh, so I consider myself very fortunate. Uh, I think one of the most important requirements for a board member, first of all, it's not a part-time job anymore. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's, it's a job that requires uh, a lot of time, uh, not only meeting during the board's uh, sessions, but also outside of that. Yeah. Roger, if I can intervene on that. Yeah. In surveys that some of these firms that consult with boards conduct, they often say that a director on average will spend about 200 hours, 200 hours per year in their service as a non-executive director. That's always seemed very high to me. Is that a correct figure, do you think? I would say a normal course of time today in the U.S. corporation is, is a pretty reasonable figure. And, you yeah. know, having been involved in some of these transformational companies that you just mentioned, Tyco and Arconic and Hewlett Packard and even Delphi, uh, it, they have taken a lot more time. More than that, okay. So, so, it's, so it's definitely, but I think the most important thing I think about a board member is having an independent mindset. Hmm. It is so important, and the, associated with this is what I call critical thinking. That means they're not, and the last thing I would say is having the courage to ask the tough questions. The so first is to have independent mind. Of course, that's based on experience. Second one is uh, uh, critical thinking. That means they're always looking at things from outside in, in a very objective manner. And the third one is to have the courage in a group setting, even in the face of a very strong CEO, mm -hmm. to ask the tough questions. Got the same question on another aspect to what you do as a non-executive director. You don't do it often, but when you do it, you do have to get it right, and that is to pick a CEO successor. It's often said that's the biggest decision that the board makes, and having made quite a few of those, uh, what in your own experience defines the kind of person you would like to be a CEO successor coming in, uh, assuming that the company's doing well? So not a, not a triage moment, but a normal moment. What makes for a great CEO candidate? Well, you know, I, I've sort of gone through some great selections and not, not some uh, great selections. You know, my preference, at least based mm -hmm. on my experience, is it is by far, like there's no doubt, is the most important job that board does. And frankly, mm -hmm. board only gets to do it hopefully every five to ten years. And if they get it wrong, the consequences are hugely negative, and if they get it right, it's transformational in a positive mm -hmm. way for the organization. So picking the right person is extremely critical. If we have a good succession process in place, having an internal candidate, in my belief, is always better than an external one. And especially an internal one who is an insider, outsider. Somebody who knows the organization, knows the businesses, but always looks at their organization from an outside, external point of view. And that's the objectivity that's very important, not to be mired in what you know and what you're told from inside. Uh, the second thing, maybe it's an overstated word, is learning agility and skills. Mm. You know, the business world is changing so fast. And that's what I find fascinating across industry, the common threads and themes. But folks who are always willing to learn and adapt yeah. is a very important skill. The third one, I would say, is surrounding themselves with people smarter than them and sometimes getting out of their way as well. You know, this human side of the equation to me is perhaps the strongest trait a leader should have because in today's world, everybody has a great strategy. There's plenty of money available. 
the sole differentiator between successful organizations and not so successful is the leader leadership at the top and the leadership team broadly. If you get that right, I, th yeah. I think it makes a whole lot of difference. See, that leads me to one of the things that I uh, found most memorable about your book, uh, which are reflections towards the end of your book. And one of them that really touched my heart was where you talk about the importance of leaders learning to balance a healthy ego with humility. Uh, I wonder if you could give some advice on how CEOs can do that and how you manage that balance in your own life. And I'm glad, Mukul, <laughs> that you asked that question. I'm, I'm a, you know, maybe this is just me or my nature. I, I think humility opens you to a lot of good input from outside. Because if you are approachable and humble, people will tell you what they like about you and what they don't like about you. And I think, you know, when you get rise to these senior, very high positions, it's so easy to surround yourself and always hear how great you are. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is a big danger for most leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so, 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 so I think it's... And, and on the other hand, you know, having self-confidence and a healthy ego is an important part of demonstrating about your confidence and self-belief that you have. And that's very important as well. I mean, it's not... Because if you want to be decisive, you have to trust your instinct. You have to have a healthy ego. On the other hand, I think if you are also humble and available for a conversation and open feedback, it just makes you a better person and a better leader. Do hmm. you want to ask the last question? So, Raj, the um, title of your book I've always found very interesting because it really references your your. <laughs> what you had in your pocket, a few dollars when you arrived in the U.S. And thinking back to that, fa that early phase in your life and speaking to people, let's say, of about the same age, those maybe in their teens, 20s, and 30s, given the wisdom that you've acquired by serving on boards, given the wisdom that you acquired by serving as chief executive, what advice would you have for people who have a few dollars in their pocket, they're in their early 20s, but they one day would like to have an impact on the world akin to the impact you have had. Well, you know, the, you know having a belief in yourself is an important uh, asset to have. And not limiting yourself. Most of us limit ourselves, you know, and, uh, rather than somebody else telling you. Mm -hmm. One of the great lessons I learned when I was here as an immigrant in the early, early years all my Indian friends who were my uh, age and similar family backgrounds, they would tell me occasionally that, you know, we will never become managers. You know, we are engineers or we are scientists, and that's what we will be technicians, technical experts, but we'll never become leaders or managers. And for whatever reason, I'm so glad I had a chance to get out from the United States and live in a different environment and shed that notion. And over time, I think belief in yourself is so important. And the other thing I would say is working in an organization that you feel will give you a fair chance. You know, it, because mm -hmm. organizations have their own culture. Selecting the right organization you work with and then having belief in yourself that it's going to be a fair place for me to realize my potential. If you get that combination, I think sky is the limit for most of us. Oh, Raj, Mike, thank you so much for joining us today at Knowledge at Wharton. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. For more insight from Knowledge at Wharton, please visit knowledge.wharton.upenn.edu.